for your introduction. Hi everyone. Uh, I wish to that we have this com uh, conference not virtually, but uh, thanks to coronavirus. <laughs> uh, in this session, uh, Jerry Corbin Corbin Sanos uh, will uh, discuss about the question if Kaleski uh, is in behavioral economics or can we consider him as if so in the 21st century and uh, he is an associate professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at the Federation University of Australia and uh, Kaleczki uh, is an important figure for him uh, regarding his research topics on innovation, investment uh, expenditure, business cycles, and entrepreneurial activity. Uh, Jerry has supervised lots of PhD students and also advised local councils, regional development boards, and social service organizations. He has written some books and uh, lots of book chapters and articles. Uh, the titles of his books are Investment Cycles in Capitalist Economics, published in 1996, and Cycles, Crisis and Innovation, published uh, eight years ago. And uh, the floor is yours, Jerry. Thank you very much, um, Ilan. And thanks for um, everyone who has stayed to the last session of today's conference. Appreciate your time here. Um, as, is, um, as is now conventional in um, conferences here in Australia, I wish to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional country of the Gunjamari people of Southwest Victoria in Australia. And I pay my respects to the elders and I recognize and respect their cultural heritage beliefs and relationships with the land. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I've just recognized this is an important part of our attempts to um, reconcile with our, with our Indigenous um, brothers. Um, I'd like to put up my slides and so what I'll do is I'll put up my screen and Ilian, are they all there clear to, for people to see? Sorry? Hello? Ilian, can you see the screen, my PowerPoint? No, I cannot see it. Oh, wait a minute. Um, let me see. Uh, in the middle so button. What I'll do, I'll press share screen. Yeah. Um, oh, wait a minute. Let me. Um, no, there you yes. Go. Yes, you can. Right. All right. So people can see the screen now. All right? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, thank you um, for um, attending. Now, this paper comes from um, an earlier paper that I gave um, in 1990 in Warsaw on the um, at the centenary birth of Kalecki, and I gave this paper in 1990, which was published in 2004 in a book on Kalecki's economics today. Louis Philippe um, was very generous of asking me to come on and reflect on what I said back then. Um, my paper back in 1990 uh, was based on a lot of research I did on the investment decision-making behavior of large manufacturing firms, the monopoly co capitalists, effectively in, in Australia initially and then globally. When I did Australia, I only looked at steel, aluminium and motor vehicle industries because they made up 70% of all the physical capital of investment during the post-war period up to 1990. So they were significant. 
So I was studying the decision making that um, investment firms were making. So that's the behavioural element of what I was looking at. Now, since 1990, there's been significant structural changes to the global economy, particularly as they've merged um, from the World Wide Web. And in 1990, I became aware of this new economy and I was beginning to look at how we can understand this new economy. And evolutionary economics had been, and still is, working a great deal in this area on evolutionary economics. For a long time, they've been addressing, from a Schumpeterian perspective, technical change, structural change, from a systems perspective, recognizing the shift from manufacturing to services. And so in my 1990 paper, I raised seven areas of research as an agenda to explore Koletskian um, behavioral analysis as it evolves into the 21st century. So what I'm now, I've done some work in the last 20 years in some of these areas. Now quickly, the, these areas about endogenous and exogenous innovation and how it affects cycles and growth, which is a significant area that I've worked in. Looking at the cumulative path of investment and how it's bringing a traverse into our system and shifting and looking at whether this, how it affects regional um, development and, and how resilience is affected. Uh, then there's linking demand on the Keynesian side with the supply side that the evolutionaries talk about in terms of modeling. Um, the role of full employment, which is central to Kaletsky and how, and the role of the political business cycle in this new age of IT service-based economy. Um, are looking at rules and conventions and how they change um, uh, because it's from the rational, bounded or satisfying rationality now changes. And much of it is based on macro level foundations, not micro. Um, income inequality in the new economy has become greater. There's information rich, information poor, which has exacerbated the income and the, um, the income, info, income rich and income poor. And where does planning fit in given the need to plan for a sustainable development and grassroots movement towards planning for the future, which is in crisis. So these are the sort of things that I looked at, which are very distinctly not Keynesian, but I see them as being Koletskian. So, um, have now 220, I see a new economy of what has been called the third industrial revolution. Not information technology per se, but information technology as a general purpose technology that enables all industry sectors to change their organizational forms, their business structures, and how new monopoly capitalist firms are now in power. So if you look at the top, 50 firms now compared to um, in the 1980s, there's hardly any that match. The new monopoly capitalists are totally different firms. They're the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, the Corgans, very different monopoly cap. So um, they are different, but in what way does the way in which they operate make the analysis different or similar to what manufacturing would do? These are the sort of questions. So I'm, I'm been looking at significant events that IT has shaped the narrative in the last 20 years since I wrote um, in 1999. The events that I can hear of is first the tech wreck. Um, the first thing that happened when all the technology, small technology firms crashed in March 20, 20, um, not 2020, sorry, March 200. I made an error there. It should be March 200. Um, 
the the um, the funds shifted to financial innovation. So they went out of the the tech wreck and went into financial innovations. Rohit from a Kaletskian um, analysis, an Indian economist, has explained how the the tech wreck money going into financial innovations was actually the basis for the global financial crisis, which happened in 2007 and 2009. Following that, there was a very short-term government stimulus, but most companies, most, uh, sorry, most governments went to austerity programs, uh, which led to stagnation or weak performance in advanced economies, which Arrestus and others have talked about. Um, this was an opportunity with the weak economies for China to rise with its export-based development, mostly around IT-based manufacturing that enabled them to move to what they are now, a mature, slower growing economy since about 2012. Um, there's been an exacerbation of national inequality. So Stillwell has shown that inequalities have actually, in each country, have become much greater since the IT revolution. And it's accompanied with the rise of what I call, a pre or what I don't, standing calls precariat class. This precariat class are people who are not in unions, who are very precarious in their jobs, and they tend to go for populist politics, which has begun to rise. What's interesting, despite all this, poor countries have not been developing. The intermediate regime story of Kaletsky still resonates. There's a persistent low, narrow range of commodity and service production and missing much of what the IT general purpose technology is going on in the advanced countries, the digital divide is there. Even in India and China, it's only small sections of those mass countries that are actually getting the advantage. And yet most of the digital um, is, is in, a, in a limited amount of people. So this, this IT has also enhanced globalization, which has exposed and intensified environmental degradation and now COVID-19. If it wasn't for all this IT enabling, we wouldn't be able to have a conference like this now. So things have moved significantly in, in the last 20 years. So what is behavioral economics? Well, the behavioral economics comes from looking at decision-making and how it's be based on discrete choices, incorporating two systems of thinking in your brain. On the right, you've got a fast moving brain, which looks at customs, habits, conventions, emotions, and these things work on a fast reaction. On the left is your logical calculating effort base, which works on a slow level. The thing is, they, to make decisions, you've got to balance the two. And in fact, an example of that is Kaletsky, and this is going to um, the question raised earlier about uncertainty. Um, in Kaletsky, he had a convention of principal increasing risk. That allowed businesses to make fast decisions on a problem that was on the left brain, which was calculating uncertainty. So you need a convention for businesses to go ahead and actually make decisions. If they spent all their time calculating marginal costs and whether, and they'd never make the decision. So that's why um, markup pricing, um, principle of increasing risk on the fire, are conventions by Kaletsky to be able for businesses to move fast um, through their right brain. Now, that means that economics comes into it when you try to avert losses, especially uncertainty, 
depending on your endowment and how well you are in, in able to address these losses. And therefore, you need a cognitive framing. You need to frame it in some way. And Kolecki was able to, because of his empirical research, like my own when I'm looking at businesses, be able to see how businesses frame their decision making and reflect on it and change their conventions if they need to. And what that means for us as an analyst is to look at the real world as a guide, what has happened in the past and use that as a way to try and understand what we need to do to change in order to have a better world in the future through guide, support or incentives in order to change, which is a political economy. And all this is actually based on Peter Earle's book on behavioral economics. Um, and, and that is the basis of my explanation of Kolecki's behavior. Um, now, what am I looking at? Well, first I'm looking at realism. I'm looking like Kolecki did as stylized facts. And what I see is all those things that I mentioned before about the significant events that have happened as a result of the World Wide Web. It's created a different real world experience now from the one that Kolecki. And as Peter Chrysler and Joseph Alevi met, we are, it's a dynamic world. We have moved very differently now from the world in which Kolecki was in which was a manufacturing with a working class that was based around unions and based around organization and so on. Um, so we're looking at those changes. We're also looking at uncertainty. We're living in, as everybody calls in, unprecedented times. This happened even before COVID, but even more now. We need new conventions, new ways of framing the future to make important decisions now because of that uncertainty. I, we see in so many places, in so many organizations, they're still using the previous century frames. So the police are still using the old framework and that's why the Black Lives Movement is so concerned that the police have not framed their world. And that's why the Black Lives Movement have got um, 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 videos and photos and, and Instagrams and everything to expose what police are doing. When in the old days, the police used to do it and nobody saw what was happening. Rio Tinto in Australia have just um, um, ruined a sacred site in West Australia and the, and the second largest um, mining and metal company in Australia, who I examined um, in, in, in its previous life when it was uh, were in metal production. Um, Rio Tinto destroyed this sacred site because it used an old frame of mining without recognizing the importance of Aboriginal heritage, which has now led to the, um, to the resignation of the CEO and two other significant executives in the company. So what we've got to see is how this, and this um, reflects the production process now that organically has moved to be much more interdependent and much more complex and global than it's ever done before. And I've taken these three frames from Mark Lavoie's post-classical paradigm and put them in the context of the 21st century, because all three are, con are consistent with the heterodox view of how we look at the future. Now, the one other bit of behavioral economics um, that I'm adding in is about change and how we bring about change by learning. It's all the process of social learning. Um, Adolf Lowe, who talked about Kolecki's work as a predecessor that helped him to talk about how we build from the short term to the long term. Short term is the period in which we make decisions. 
which then builds from the short term. So Kalecki was always talking about the short term sessions making up towards the long term. So long term is nothing more than the, the, the cumulative development of short term decision making. So um, Adolf Lowe realized that to get to a goal, you've got to go back from the goal to the decision making now and develop a pathway there. And Alevi with, with, his, um, with the co-author have talked about this in, in a recent um, paper. So what are these changes? Well, first of all, there's four first order changes. These are incremental routines that is the fast thinking without need to use any of your calculating brain. And, and these are, in Kalecki's terms, you have desired excess capacity, gearing ratios. You react to the interest rates in terms of the principle of increasing risk. So, and, and you make those decisions on a day-by-day -day basis. So that's a four first order change. The second order of change is policy strategies. When governments, when businesses decide to move to a new type of product or business or, um, or governments decide to, to put out a budget and work out what they're gonna do next year. This is slow thinking, but it's relatively within um, a consistent pattern ordered from the first order built up from the, to the second order. Then comes the third order. This is where the transition happens. Well, this is where slow thinking actions have to address the implementation of traverse to change the development, um, not based on optimal growth, but, uh, but based on moving in a more sustainable way and satisfying activity as, as best we can as we move on. So we need to examine the structure of production and the levels of technology and the, the type of capital goods and production that's going on now. And we need to cascade up. Governments need to look at planning, and I mean true planning in the way that Kalecki talked about, to set up the third order changes in order that the second and third order can cascade. If we don't change the third order, we're just going to have the same old first and second and the frames won't change. We need third order changes to change. Already, IT has enabled us to do this, but too many of us are still stuck in the old frame. Um, and the new frame must be involved with as many stakeholders as possible in order to be able to identify which way this sort of third order change comes. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, I've talked about this. Let's review Kalecki and literature in the last 20 years. Now, the good thing about the Kalecki and literature, it is very strong on recognizing that austerity state policies have not helped and have, have been um, anti full employment. And the literature looks at shifts of income distribution away and the buildup of excess profits. So this is a very um, strong and what I see affirmative aspect that doesn't change. There are some things about capitalism that doesn't change and that is consistent. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button and uh, I went right to the end of my, right. Um, so the, the intellectual base that they're criticizing, that Kalecki and literature has been criticizing, has been the neoliberal agenda since the 1970s. And again, that's a very important thing to, um, to, to expose that neoliberal agenda. So they're, they're, they're the positives. The adverse aspects, well, the policy responses to these affirmative aspects has been particularly wage -led, wages-led growth. And that is consistent 
with Kain Kaletskin analysis of the 20th century. Can I tell you that wages-led growth is a waste of time to analyze? There's two objections. First, John King wrote in 2009, only last year, obstacles to wage-led growth. They are massive. There is no way, we don't have organized unions anymore. We, we will not have a wages-led growth. It is impossible. Given the change in structure of our society in the 21st century, we do not have an organized working class anymore. It is dead. And so wages-led is no longer relevant. Neither is growth per se. We cannot just deliver growth for the sake of full employment when we can destroy our, co our, co our economy, our ecology and our societies. It's not relevant. So we've got to reframe these things in the 21st century. Now, the, the problem is that agency is still thought about as manufacturing working class. It is not. The reserve army is no longer the working class. The reserve army are the precariat, are the pre precarious workers, the precariat class. This has been called by standing. These can be anything from highly educated, casual teachers who've got, who we've got heaps of them in my university, who will never ever get a full-time academic job, to taxi drivers with PhDs, to women, um, being slave labor in textile production, highly exploited, and, and they have no agency at all. None of them have any power. And many of them, when they, when they don't have power, they appeal to the past. They go back. They go back to something about, oh, we've got to have unions. Or they'll go to a Trump and, and say to Trump, we need you to make America great again. So lost, so very many populists um, follow that because they have a precarious life and they've got no other answer. Some precarious are migrants, refugees, temporary um, students who have no home, who are, don't vote, who are in your um, countries, but they are not even voting, they have no rights, and they are the biggest precarious of all. And they're out of the, they're out of the system. Um, the others, there are some progressives, but they're apathetic. The progressives are in huge debts and they're inactive. So they say a plague on all your houses and we're not gonna vote at all. So that's why you have so many people not voting because many of them say, well, all the politicians are sitting in a 19, 20th century frame and not addressing what we are wanting. So plague on all your houses. This is what Guy Standing says. The precariat class is the new class, not the working class. Now, the institutions are also changed. So the structure of developed economies have changed. Capitalist class is now split between the long-term entrepreneurial class who are becoming smaller and smaller and the short-term spe speculator class, the fractions of capital, the financialization, the class split has, has also led to significant splits in the, in the politics of the political um, business cycle because of it. Unions have reduced their re re relevance. Um, it's now, Kaletsky's discipline comes by precarious jobs. That's the new discipline range. Wage theft is right. In all industries, most of the monopoly capitalists don't even, it's not even calculated in, in their marginal costs and so on. It's total wage theft. It's total exploitation. There's insecurity in, in jobs. So you, you're not given a job for life, not even for five years. You might be there for six months. That's the structure of our economy. We now, workers, if you look at it, in Kaletsky's, they workers spend all their, their income. No longer. Workers save all their income as much as they can because they are in debt. They're huge debt. So there is, there's enormous amount of attempt to 
to save to pay for their debts. So this this has changed the nature of workers and and what they're doing. Transfer of jobs to less developed economies means that if you try to increase wages in your country, forget it. They're going to go overseas anyway. So the, what's interesting is the structure of less developed economies is based on still unequal trading, still based on that, um, and limited IT enabling. So the intermediate regimes of autocratic states are still in existence in the less developed economies and have prevented any trickle down effect from working. Now, I've criticized Kolesky and literature, but Stockhammer and Ramscholar have, have looked at post Keynesian economics and said they've contributed to monetary economics and medium term growth. But, and this is them, it appears the core features have become obsessive debating points against neoclassic. Despite monetary policy becoming less and less relevant and growth less and less sustainable, now with, with interest rates of um, virtually zero, um, everything depends on fiscal policy now. We have to get out of our COVID crisis, not through monetary policy, because that's been done to death. It's it, um, from about um, after the quant quantitative easing, there's not much that monetary policy can do now. It's fiscal policy that needs it. Um, so it's, it's, if, you're, if you're still stuck in a capital debate with the neoclassicals, we're never going to get out of, uh, of a 20th century frame. Keynes' analysis, and as, as some of this um, would... Um, uh, uh, Professor um, um, Christina uh, mentioned, um, Macuso mentioned yesterday, ha, um, earlier, how Kalecki has in some way been subsumed under post Keynesian analysis. And post Keynesian analysis is reductionist, closed based on the Marshallian approach. That's not Kalecki. Kalecki is more open ended and and has a political economy perspective that the Cambridge approach doesn't have. So I like to see Kaletzian economics not subsumed under post-Keynesian because it, it sort of loses its radicalness, its, its Marxist, if you will, approach, because that's where I see it coming from, from the approach that um, um, Peter Chrysler and Joseph Alevi talked about. So when you look at this article, um, what they say um, is they state that post Keynes has little to say on issues by which some important groups of modern society are concerned with. Um, they say, and I quote, post Keynesian offers little on important real world phenomena like globalization of production and social issues like precarization and the polarization of income distribution and economic challenges like climate change. Now, they've said this in 2009, right? I believe that Kalecki has a very good framework to appropriate that for the 21st century. I don't think post Keynesians have. Um, he recommends that post Keynesians need to cooperate institutionally with heterodox approaches, which I'm doing with evolutionary. My problem is that, and my question, and this is my question to the audience, and if anybody has, has, has this answer, I'd like to know, because maybe I haven't looked at the post-Keynesian literature enough. To what extent has the post-Keynesian and even Kaletskian analysis answered the call set by Stockhammer and Rom Scholar 10 years ago in 2009? To what extent has have they, um, has post Keynesian able to, in the last 10 years, offer real world phenomena like globalization, social issues of precarious, polarization of income distribution, economic challenges like climate change? To what extent have they done this? This is my question to you folks um, and to tell me, because I don't think they've done much. Sure, there's been a few here and there, but it's very minor and it gets cited very little within the post Keynesian literature. 
So, Kalecki was a keen observer of the real world. From Poland, from pre-World War II to the Polish October, he was always looking. In the UK, the reason why he went to the Oxford Institute was he could look at real world data and be able to look at how we can frame a, a post-World War II that was in full employment. And that's what they gave him at Oxford Institute to do. And that's what he wrote about. And so again, he was re reacting to the Second World War and the worries of whether they could get to full employment, given that there, was, there hadn't been any um, full employment. There'd been lack of that with, through the Depression up to World War II. He also was through the IMF in post-World War II and experienced the USA and talked about the, the populist right of the Goldwater period starting up. And he, ex he experienced the precursor to Trump with Goldwater and talking about these people um, then. And he looked at the underdeveloped countries and saw those intermediate regime stories that we're talking about. So what I believe that Kalecki does is go from the macro to the micro, from the general to the specific, to look at what policy analysis can be done. From this approach, you identify central features of Kalecki's um, uh, approach. And of course, still important in the 21st century is the effective demand theory. Still important in the 21st century is the importance of investment, how profit drives investment and how the investment then drives profit. How important it is to, to have a plan that allows consumers to meet their needs for consumption, which are huge in this precarious world. So it is still many of Kalecki's um, um, frames, elements, but there's two that I reject. First, growth, talks about growth. Growth, GDP growth can no longer be our goal. The, it is socially a miscalculation, ecologically, if we ignore it, it, it's going to be to the harm of our society. We need to heavily qualify our, our um, analysis. And I've done research in Timor-Leste, just above Australia, one of the poorest countries in the world. And there they need growth. But that is different from what advanced economies need. So each country needs to look at it in terms of enhancing employment, decent jobs, and what decent jobs may, may mean in, in a world. And that relates to the sustainable development goal number eight, which is talk about decent jobs. Um, the, the other term is socialism. Now, socialism, we, I believe we need a viable humane socialism that Kalecki thought would be the sort that he thought through Polish October he would be able to succeed. We heard from, from Professor Ostaninsky how that failed. Um, so we need to look at not socialism of the old, but of strategic planning that needs to tame and erode some of the worst excess of capitalism. Whether that's called socialism or not, we need a focus on, on, on not optimizing, but of moving through Lowe's long-term iterative planning and Kalecki's short-term perspective planning, which I've talked about in my book in 2012. We've got to move to a goal-oriented journey of shifting to a planned economy, it, whether you call it social, but a more planned economy. We are planned now, but we are planned by different forces. The austerity and the monopoly capitalists are planning us. Galbraith always said that. Um, we've just got to change the frame of our plan. Um, Michael White um, said that Kalecki saw the process very much in terms of a military strategy, rejecting the market-oriented theory of bourgeois economists and positioning the necessity for economic planning. And with COVID-19, with climate change, with ecological degradation and poverty and social justice. We need planning tools. No, we don't need carbon taxes and subsidies. They may help, 
but they're not the way to plan a future because they are all based on market-based motivations, which is not what Kalecki wanted. What we need is to operate in a dynamic system which we don't allow the capitalists to, because the capitalists themselves are masters of their own fate. They often ruin themselves, as we know through the political sub, uh, business cycle. We've got to operate a system that can drive investment in a much more positive way than what has been done recently. So we've got to focus on big business, um, change the nature of what they're doing. Kalecki talked about in innovation as being a significant development effect. Well, we need to have, um, we need to generate an innovation context that allows firms to, to innovate in a way that will plan towards a more positive and more ecologically and socially relevant society. So um, what we need is using Schumpeter's inspiration with complementing with Kalecki's ideas of innovation. We need a path dependent trajectory that changes um, the mesoeconomic forces so that the meso, the large firms will adjust to the way in which we structure our planning, our industries and our sectoral level. How much time have I got, Ilan, so I can understand? If I, is, is my 45 minutes just about ended? How much time have I got? Ilan? Hello, anybody? How much time have I got? Yeah, you have eight minutes. Thank you. Right. That should get me up. Oh, oh, sorry, again, I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. All right. So, combining Schumpeter's clusters of innovation with Rothbard was a, um, was a colleague of of Kalecki, who died in the Second World War flying um, fighter planes over France. He reviewed Schumpeter and said, we, he need, Schumpeter's work needs an adaptive mechanism to enable the clusters to work. And he said, the only adaptive mechanism that I'm aware of is the one that Kalecki provides through investment in the, in, in the short term. And so, Combining them together with the, an understanding of less developed con, uh, economies and the state relations in intermediate re regimes, combining this, we can actually put together a whole new way in which we can have new investments which capture profits for fir firms. But this pro process must be one in which innovation is controlled not by capitalists and big business, but is driven by a state-based innovation policy that will drive and meet a truly democratic state that control and drive a goal-focused sustainable development. Now, what is this goal? What is it going to be? Well, the opportunity now we have is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. The, you know, it is important that we have sustainable development as it provides us with the fundamental needs of humankind in the future. It's the path for the future. This is where the SDGs come into it, where we provide a way of combining our mind with the nature. That's what we're doing now with COVID. We're combining our mind with the nature the nature of, of diseases or the nature of the ecology. We've got to spend more time looking at how we're going to adapt to, to these. And we need the community to come along with us on this. These are all the sustainable development goals that have been set up by the United Nations. There's 17 of them. Um, this is a way you can look at them from the biosphere to society and the economy. You see, the most important is the biosphere. The economy up there is the smallest cog that drives things, but it's the biosphere that is the foundations of it all. 
And there, that sustainable development is the middle between economic, environmental, and social. And we need it because our ice caps are melting and our polar bears don't go, got nowhere to go. So we don't want to have debate, we want action. And even the IMF has said, we need to sustain life. We need the UN Sustainable Development Goals as an action-oriented way to move forward. So this is my third order change, to identify in each country what the Sustainable Development Goals are as, and you frame them in an instrumental analysis and you harness the, uh, the, the general purpose technologies, especially around IT, to develop a perspective plan to locally based democratic movement, we can do it because we've got all the IT based um, um, enhancement technologies to actually bring everybody together and to actually address these issues together. So it's a cumulative effective demand story. You start to build it, it's co-evolutionary. There are a whole lot of techniques of transition management to overcome technology lock-ins. And the market will fall into line. Capitalists will always want to make profits as long as you set the criteria for what they want to do, they'll go ahead and they'll work. Um, what you need is a good investment and financing plan to underpin what you want. COVID-19 provides us with the opportunity behaviorally to institute an instrumental perspective plan. Already economies are on a military footing. We should take this as our emergency to, to move our economies in an emergency footing, to reject green growth, green new deals, degrowth. None of them are viable. What only is viable is something called the, the, the Sustainable Development Goals. They are viable because the UN has given it support. So it looks, it looks good. It uses an already established institution that we can use as a basis for building goals. And our goals would be in each country, a country that de determines which are the most important sustainable development goals over what period of time and how to develop them. This is our opportunity to actually move and reframe our economies for the, tw for the rest of the 21st century. And that's where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for your insightful and striking uh, presentation. I have also some questions, but I am a democratic chair. That's why priority first belongs to audience. <laughs> then I will address my question. Uh, Eric has wrote his question. He has the right to address his question verbally first. Thank you Eric, very please. much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I, I enjoyed that presentation. I um. I work at the Stockholm Environment Institute where I, I focus on the SDGs and low carbon transitions and I, mm -hmm. I uh, use um, uh, a variety, uh, Kelletskian, but also um, uh, Srafian uh, and, yeah. and classical models to try to understand uh, those processes. Um, so overall, it was just really, really great to see uh, your ideas. I was, I was, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the presentation, but I got stuck on the slide where you you uh, said that report, uh, the paper by Stockhammer, and I forget who else on on. Yeah, yep. Right. Yep. So um, I I I read Mark Lavoie uh, heavily for post Keynesian economics to, to yep. as, as my basis and he's quite he, he opens his arms wide um, and and uh, bases quite a bit of it on on uh, Kalitsky and and is is has in in my view been very clear about not wanting to spend much time critiquing neoclassical he just it's like yeah it's bad okay now let's talk about uh, what what post keynesian economics is um but then beyond that i was wondering where you would put structuralists like lance taylor ocampo and others who use kalitskian analysis not only that but definitely looking at global systems of production 
and the, the various people doing ecological economics models using stock flow consistent, Kalisky and Srafian, et cetera. Um, right. Yeah, is it, is it enough? Right. Or, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, um, sorry, sorry, Jerry, can you please yeah, no. tell me your views? Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, look, uh, the two questions. First of all, in terms of Mark Lavoie, I have much time for Mark Lavoie. In fact, I've quoted him a few times. I believe that the frame that he has set is the correct one about how post Keynesians should, should move forward. And everybody pays rhetorical um, context to, to what Mark Lavoie says. But when I look at the citations, when I look at the debates, when I look at the week out, month out journals and what they're doing, they're still stuck, as Stockholm has said, and Rosma, they're still stuck in the monetary analysis. No no aspersions to uh, Louis Philippe, who I know is involved in that and so are others. It's important, but I think that has been a big area and there's been all this modeling on wage-led um, modeling, wage-led growth, wage-led growth. Now, all this has been um, increasing and the amount of citations on that has been increasing since 2009 criticism. So despite the rhetoric, the reality is people go back to their comfort zone, to what they are comfortable with. They don't go to Lance Taylor, who I agree. They don't go to the evolutions, who I agree. This, the idea that Stockholm says, is we need to open our um, arms to more, um, to wider group of post-classical paradigms. And I'm 100%, I've, I've quoted Lance Taylor and the others in that institutional area, the evolutions. I, I think all of them have important things to say. None of them have the important short-term analysis that Kaletsky has. He has the short-term analysis of how to build planning because Laos, Adolf Lowe said, you can't just go from here to there. You've got to have, you've got to set where you've got to go and then you've got to build back and to build back you've actually used short-term analysis with Kaletsky because if you start here and say I'm going to get there that's what neoclassicals do and they never get there the 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 trouble is even the um, the the sustainable development goals have been set up with indicative planning to 2030 nobody's going to get there because all indicative planning going forward it's bullshit it's got to go backwards and it can only be done with Kaletsky short-term mechanisms. So that's where Kaletsky is very important, but he's got to be taken out of this debates that seem to constrict him within a post-Keynesian framework that doesn't take you to the places where I'd like Kaletsky to go. Well, that was the first question. What was the second? What was the second? Harry, sorry? What was the second you, question? You kind of covered uh, oh. the, the different aspects. Now, that was perfect. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, uh, next, Amitava, you have the floor to address your question. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, hi. Um, hi. Uh, it's an interesting and broad-ranging talk, but perhaps a little too broad-ranging uh, in sure. the sense... I that's fine. I, 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 I do that. Well, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of doing that, but I won't go into that. But no. when, I, when I saw the topic, I thought you'd talk about behavioral economics of Kaleski um, to compare it to what we now call, at least not many people now call behavioral e economics based on uh, you know, all these, uh, well, they even got Nobel Prize for, for some of that too, okay? Uh, so I didn't see any of that uh, direct yep. comparison. What I did see is a lot of discussion of the realist or critical realist approach and um, uh, some talk of open systems approach. I, I, 
don't see how that really relates to Kalechki. I mean, you, you can view Kalechki in those terms. Frankly, I don't even understand what critical realism is all about, uh, but, but that's a different issue. But I, I'm wondering why all that is relevant to the topic you were discussing. And then all the issues you raised about, say the environment, technological change, there are useful ideas, but again, you know, they, they kind of tangentially tangentially related to Kalechki's writings, I think. Okay, Kalechki focuses on the importance of technological change and so forth. So I, I am a little confused by why your paper is called Kalechki as a behavioral economist and how many of the interesting things you say are really built up on, on Kalechki. One final point, uh, in terms of political economy issues, uh, you seem to put a lot of faith in in the current crisis, creating openings for, for um, you know, political economy changes. Um, I live in the United States, and I, and I don't see that happening. Uh, quite to the contrary. So I, so I think there has to be a, a more broad-based political economy analysis of what's going on. Uh, in in different countries, in in terms of the rise of authoritarianism, uh, you know, uh, the the rise of, well, let's call it semi-fascistic <laughs> things and so forth. So anyway, a, a broad paper with some broad comments that I made. Yeah. Uh, um, in relation to the second question, I'll come back to you after the third of. Uh, November elections. Um, I think that Biden has incorporated quite a bit of Sanders um, plans and structures. If Biden wins, I think there will be a, an opportunity. If he doesn't, then the precarious class have become so large and so dominating that it makes it makes it even harder. So I've already indicated the precarious class have made it very difficult for change. So I'm not, I'm not underestimating the difficulty, um, but I think Biden will bring the United States back to the United Nations table. Sustainable development goals can be back on the table and some more realistic, um, along the lines that I painted would, in, would happen. If not, then my darker picture of the, the way in which the old frame has resulted in, um, in, in greater precariousness of life will continue, including the greater ecological degradation of the world. And uh, I don't want to preach um, negativeness, so I didn't want to go that path. Um, so I'm hoping. So on this, on the first one on behavioural economics, there are what Peter Earle talks about: old behavioural economics and new behavioural economics. I didn't go into that detail. Um, Peter Earle, as I set out, the the elements of his behavioural economics is what he calls the old behavioral economics that's still quite a significant heterodox, if you want to, behavioral economics um, that exists. The new behavioral e economics is, as I understand it, really a way of, um, again, imperializing neoclassical economics within uh, an understanding of behavior and trying to do it with experiments and all that in, in closed system reductionist approaches that don't get us anywhere. And it's not the sort of stuff that I think Kalecki would, would be interested. Kalecki was interested in businesses and how they make decisions. They make decisions by conventions, by rules. They do that to overcome uncertainty. The decision making that investors they make is behavioral. That is the decision making that I'm talking about and how the, 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 the planning that is set up by the state needs to change the dynamics 
So the framing of the investment decisions become more in line with what Koletsky wanted, i.e. full employment and a more humane society than what we have currently. Okay, Louis Philippe, please. <clears throat> no, no, that's okay. I, um, I wanted to make a comment about what you had said before, but you know, someone says, you know, wh where do you put um, Lance Taylor and all these people? And it goes back to the question I asked to uh, Christina, you know, my own approach to macroeconomics is very eclectic. And I would tend to, to see, you know, a little, probably a lot of Kaletsky, but still a lot of Keynes, you know, despite their shortcomings and certainly Lance fits in there. And that I think is what Lavoie does as well. His career has been characterized by finding uh, 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 similarities between uh, feminists and uh, ecological economists and post Keynes and the Schraffians and all these people. He has a couple of papers on, you know, should Schraffians be part of, of heterodox economics and all. So that's just a comment I wanted to do. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm all, all in favor of that. that. I, I, I do think it's horses for courses. And depending on which part of the broad palette that I've identified you'd be looking at, then you look at a specific part of, of that, which depending on which sustainable development goal or whatever you're looking at, mm -hmm. then you take a particular uh, type of analysis um, that may not always be Koletskian, but um, can, can incorporate some of the others. It's just that I think a frame um, of planning is important. And I think that the type of planning that Koletsky talked about is relevant as more now than it ever did. And so it's the planning that I think emphasis is on. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other question? You can raise your hand as you know, or you can write down on the chat screen. If not, I have a question. Uh, my question, indeed about the concept of behavioral economics. Uh, I am not sure if we can call uh, what do economic agents do as behave, behavior. They make decisions, okay, whether to invest or not to consume or to save, etc. But behave or behavior is something different. You can behave within a community to each other, badly or good, and so on. Uh, that's why <clears throat> I think it is much more consistent for post Keynesian approach to base the psychological background on structural psychological approach. In psychological dis psychology discipline, there are lots of different approaches, behavioral psychology, structures, and so on. Uh, yes, you know, nowadays, uh, within the mainstream or neoclassical uh, economics, the behavioral economics is a hot topic. They try to analyze and understand the irrationality and in order to restore their arguments. But do we have to also rely on this psychological approach to combat with them? Or it's better to uh, Equipe uh, ourselves with then another psychological uh, understanding, maybe structures. And thank you. I am in full agreement about the need for economics to learn from other disciplines, and as much as we can, if we can learn and incorporate or bring them together. Um, to help us understand our work, then I think it is important. But it's within what frame of reference we incorporate them. So you can take the psychological part. Um, if you spend all your time looking at um, happiness indicators and looking at marketing type of stuff that allows some people to try and understand what the cell the and why how better to sell a this product why it should be red or blue or something that 
is incorporating it within a market system that already exists. And I'm not, I'm not, that's not where I'm going. I'd like to see the, um, the, the, the work of psychologists coming more into trying to understand agency and structure and see how, given our change of structures, what sort of agency do we have and what are we able to do on a country by country, even region by region, to understand agency as individuals and as groups, as classes in our society, not just as individuals, but as classes, and that we need to provide agency to a larger group of, in our society than just the monopoly capitalists. So that agency has got to be greater. We're currently structured in, Australia, in, in the countries that I know, where the, the governments are actually, um, because of their political business cycle type approach, they tend to be just um, agents of, the, of monopoly capitals and, and doing their interests. And that's why in Australia, we are um, still not bringing any um, sense to um, any ecological debate because we have so many mining interests in Australia. And that's why we've destroyed um, indigenous cultural heritages because of the mining. So if you leave the frame the way it is, we're not gonna change. So it depends on how we bring the knowledge of other disciplines into what frame um, mm -hmm. is very important for me. So that's why I kept talking about framing because it's how you frame the work um, that is important. Um, and it's, you can bring anything in, even some, you know, I, I still think some basic supply and demand about how market works can, is useful. I think markets can work as long as we frame them within a, an approach that is not the type of monopoly capitalist approach that um, Kalecki was against and was wanting military action to try and get it out of there. Thank you. Any other question or comments? Uh, we have almost eight minutes more. Then shall we uh, finish here and we, Philip, you can have the uh, concluding remarks. I can make okay. a remark. Paul, Sorry, can there's a question. Yeah, just, just yes. like, let me uh, get my make my uh, video on up. <laughs> okay, please. I, I had, uh, I, I don't understand something about Jerry's proposal. You have the precarious class being increasing substantially by the way, there's a new uh, issue of the Review of Radical Political Economy, which is entirely on the precarious class or the informal work in third world countries. It's a very interesting issue. I j it just came a couple of days. Yeah, no, good. Yep. Yeah. But anyway, if the informal class is rising, the capacity of the working class is shrinking in terms of power capitalists are getting more money, not less money. I think that's pretty universal. I don't see how you are going to get any of your proposals through without, I, mean, I don't know what. I mean, um, the power is so much against workers now, so much against ordinary people. I, I, what do you yeah. think? I mean, how, how do you, how do you Yeah, no, I, my, Look, I'm, I'm holding out a thin straw of something that is highly legitimate, which is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This is my thin straw of legitimacy of where we can bring everybody to the table um, to agree. And we have signed up. Every country in the world has signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals. Some countries have taken it a lot more seriously in, in terms of developing their planning structures and how to meet those goals. You need some planning. Um, but 
Many countries have not, despite the fact that they're signed up to it. So what I'm saying is that we need to, to try and make governments more um, accountable to their signing up to the sustainable development goals. Who, who would use that as what I would call a Trojan horse to bring it in because all the things in the sustainable development goals are worthy and very important and can undermine a lot of the problems that we've already, and that's what the sustainable development goals are aiming to do. But the way that they've been brought in, 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 in many countries um, has not been, but there are some countries in Europe that actually have taken it a lot more seriously than say the US or Australia and so on. So, but yeah, it's, 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 it's my one um, way of trying to say there is a legitimate um, player on the table being the United Nations that we should all get around and try to use it as a basis for what I think is a change frame that we need. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, very good uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Jerry, considering it is um, now 6 a.m. for you. So you, ba you basically stayed up for us and it's very, very appreciated. Uh, thank, thank you. you Thank you, Elon, and thank you for uh, thank everyone. Thank you, Elon. Thank and you we'll so. see you back tomorrow morning. It starts at 9 a.m. We have papers by uh, Tom uh, 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 Sawyer, Toporowski, yeah, and, Blacker. Robert, and Robert Blacker. Yeah, we begin with Robert Blacker tomorrow at General Kalekian Model. Okay? Yes. So thank you, everyone. Good night and All see right. you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, see you tomorrow.